Hi everyone, we're going to discuss the mole ratios and reaction stoichiometry lab and this is going to talk a little bit about the background here. The lab is about trying to figure out the stoichiometry between the reactants and products in these two reactions right here. So the first reaction or reaction A is between sodium bicarbonate and hydrochloric acid to produce sodium chloride, carbon dioxide, and water. And then in the second reaction, we swap the reactant to sodium carbonate and still react in with hydrochloric acid to produce the same three products. The interesting thing here, of course, is that sodium bicarbonate and sodium carbonate have a slightly different formula as illustrated here in the formula equation. And you can see as a result of that, the stoichiometry between the reactant and the product is going to change. So it's a one-to-one -one stoichiometry between sodium bicarbonate and sodium chloride. And in reaction B, it's a one-to-two stoichiometry between sodium carbonate and sodium chloride. So that's what we're going to explore in this reaction. Now, the idea of this reaction is that you can use stoichiometry to help you determine what the actual coefficients are of reactants or chemical species, in this case, if you don't know what they are. So that's illustrated with this example right here. So let's say we have a reaction between A and X to form compound C, and then we have another reactant B, which reacts with X to form C again, but with a different stoichiometry. So we have two different reactions that look like this. A plus X goes to C, and then B plus X goes to C. And what we're interested in this case is finding out what those stoichiometric coefficients are in front of A, and C. Uh, we of course will be interested at some point about the stoichiometric coefficient of X as well, but right now this particular situation we're just analyzing what the relationship is between A and C. And then next we'll look at B and C. So let's say we know the molar masses of these compounds A, B, and C as given here. And a student wants to know what the relationship, the stoichiometric relationships between those species. So she went ahead and carried out two experiments. In one experiment, she mixes some mass of A, 0.758, with excess amount of X to produce a certain quantity of C, in this case 0.526 grams. In experiment two, she mixes, in experiment two, she mixes 0.945 grams of B now with excess X again, and that one produces 1.039 grams of C. So the question is, use the mass data to determine the stoichiometric coefficients in the two reactions. So the relationship between A and C can be determined if we can find the mole ratio of A and C, if we can find the mole ratio of A and C as we learn in lecture. So for experiment one, all you need to do is find the number of moles of A, which you can do by taking the mass that you're given divided by the molar mass of A, which gives you this number right here. Also calculate the number of moles of C, doing the same method with the molar mass of C in this case, and finding that number. And then what you need to do is just take the ratio between those two numbers, the mole of A and the mole of C, and you find that because the two numbers are 0 0.009, 0238 for A and 009, 0007 for C, you have a one-to-one -one relationship, which tells you that A and C have a one-to-one -one stoichiometry. If you want to find out the second reaction, which is the relationship between B and C, you can repeat the same steps. In this case, using the molar mass of B to get the number of moles. In this case, using the mass of B and the, num and the molar mass of B to find the number of moles of B. And similarly, using the mass of C in the second experiment with the molar mass to find the number of moles of C. And if we relate the number of moles of B to C using the ratio method, we'll find that there is a one to two relationship between A and C in this case. Okay, so that's just telling you that you are able to find stoichiometric relationship using experimental data. Now, in your experiment, of course, as we talked about earlier, you already know what these coefficients will be. With the sodium bicarbonate and sodium chloride, that's a one-to-one. -one. 
with sodium carbonate and sodium chloride, that's one to two. So going back down here, if you already know the theoretical stoichiometric relationships, then that allows you to actually calculate the percent yield of your sodium chloride products. And as you remember in our discussion and lecture, percent yield can be calculated by taking experimental yield divided by theoretical yield times 100%. So here's a quick example of how to do that. Let's say a student reacts 0.445 grams of sodium bicarbonate with excess HCl and obtains 0.304 grams of dry NaCl. What's the percent yield? Well, we start with the reaction between sodium carbonate and HCl to produce sodium chloride and the other two products. In this case, we're interested in the percent yield of NaCl. So what we first have to do is calculate the theoretical yield of NaCl, which is just the mass of the reactant divided by its molar mass and then multiply by the mole to mole ratio between NaCl and sodium bicarbonate and then multiply by the molar mass of NaCl, which gives us this number right here. So that's a theoretical yield. And then to get the percent yield, we take the actual yield, which is 0 0.304 grams, divided by theoretical yield times 100%, and we get 98.2% as our answer. So that's a pretty good uh, yielding experiment. Now let's talk a little bit about the actual steps that you're going to be doing. So you're going to carry out this reaction in something called an evaporating dish and you're going to do that by first weighing the reactant which in this case is going to be sodium bicarbonate that's what you're starting with about 0.3 to 0.4 grams of it um, once you weigh that you're going to then set up the following heating system where you have your evaporating dish you have a watch glass that will cover the evaporating dish so that when it's heating, the product doesn't splash out and then be lost. So you want to make sure you get all the products that you're going to get. And then this is a ring stand with a wire gauze over it. And then you're going to have your Bunsen burner right below it. So the idea here is that you're going to add HCl drop by drop before you heat. And once you add enough HCl, which is five milliliters in this case, then you're going to start heating it. So the process of heating here allows the reaction to go, but also more importantly, because this is carried out in aqueous environment, so there's water around, what you're trying to do is really evaporate all the water away, as well as the CO2. So remember that the reaction, just going back here to the top, the reaction produces CO2 and H2O, so you want to evaporate these guys away. The CO2 is a gas, so it should go away uh, already, but the water is a liquid, so you want to evaporate that away. So in the end, all you have is NaCl, and if it's dry enough, then it will become a solid, and that's what your final product is. That's what you're going to be doing with the Bunsen burner over time. Uh, at the beginning, you're going to do something called a gentle heating, which I'll describe a little bit more in a second, but eventually, after a while, once everything is dry, um, you should turn off the flame and then you should just weigh the evaporating dish that at that point should just contain the NaCl. You're going to repeat the same experiment again with the uh, sodium carbonate the second time around and then do this same process to get the NaCl at the end. And then you can go ahead and calculate your percent yield just like I showed you in the example earlier. Now, a little note about using Bunsen burners. Um, a Bunsen burner has different parts to it. They're not very complicated, but it's important to know how to control the flame in a Bunsen burner. So first off, there's usually a tubing or a hose that connects the Bunsen burner to the gas source. And then there's a metal base that allows the Bunsen burner to stand upright so it doesn't topple over. And then there's a couple of important pieces here. There is a part of the Bunsen burner here at the bottom near the base that's called the air hole. And so you can open it or close it. And the point of that is allowing oxygen or air, which contains oxygen in it, to come in. Now, a flame will not turn on unless you have oxygen. So combustion cannot occur unless oxygen is present. So if you close this off, then the Bunsen burner will die. There's be no flame. So this has to be slightly open. And we'll discuss sort of the different levels of opening that will cause the different flames to appear. The second part here is what's called the collar or sometimes the barrel. And sometimes that air hole is controlled by that barrel. So you might see that as you turn that, that air hole might be closer open. And a lot of times this is 
uh, associated with the height of the flame. So to make it easier or hard, uh, you know, if you want to make your flame taller or shorter, you can control it that way. In some Bunsen burner, there's also a component here that controls that gas flow. So the gas flow, in theory, you can control it using a knob. That's where the gas is coming from. But sometimes you can open that knob and then there's another little wheel here on the Bunsen burner that will allow you to adjust how much gas goes in. And gas is methane in this case, and it's the reaction between methane and oxygen that generates your flame, right? So you're gonna need both things. You're gonna need your gas, and then you're going to need your air. So the air hole and the gas input has to be available for the flame to generate. Now, let me talk a little bit about the different types of flame that you can get. In a Bunsen burner, there's two different parts of the flame. There's sort of the cold part of the flame, and there's a hot part of the flame. Now, you might think that, you know, all flames are hot, and you're correct. You never want to put your hand over a flame. But when we're talking about heating a chemical substance, there's a certain amount of temperature that we're going to need to have to heat that substance with before the reaction will take place. So here's a little illustration on the left side of the type of flame color that you would observe if you adjust that air hole. So if you completely close the hole, there's still some oxygen that will get in, but then the amount of oxygen is so little that what you get is something called an incomplete combustion. So an incomplete combustion generates this yellowish type of flame that has a lot of soot on it. And so whatever component that's being burned by this flame or where the flame is touching is going to generate a lot of dark soot, which is just carbon that is piling on the surface of the container. As you increase the size of that air hole, right, if you turn this um, barrel around, you're going to expose that air hole more and more. As you adjust it, then you're going to start seeing a transition from that yellow flame more and more towards this blue flame. So eventually you're going to get a blue flame where there is a really tall blue flame and then there is a inner cone that has a less transparent color compared to the one that's higher. Now here's the important part. We can measure the temperature of different color flames here and as you notice here, if you have this yellowish type of flame, the temperature is actually not as high as that bluish type of flame. So as you go from here to here, your flame is getting hotter and hotter. Okay. Now, more importantly, though, when you generate this flame with the inner blue cone, that inner blue cone, the tip of that cone is actually the hottest part of the flame. So you can see here that very close to the opening of the Bunsen burner, the flame is not that hot. And then at the top, it's hotter, but it doesn't compare to the tip of that inner cone, which is about 1200 degrees Celsius in this case compared to 1000 degrees Celsius there. So that's the hottest part of the flame. So if you need to heat something at very high heat, you're going to bring it to that inner cone. Now in this experiment though, remember that what we were told is to gently heat it. So you actually don't want to heat it at the tip of that inner cone. What you want to do is probably have a flame that's set like this and then just heat it right here around the top because that part is not as hot. You don't want this kind of a flame, the yellow flame, because what that will do is it would, as I said earlier, produce a lot of soot uh, from the carbon that's being burned. And then that soot is going to end up sticking to the surface of your evaporating dish, which adds mass to your evaporating dish, therefore changing the total mass, which is going to cause you error in your experiment. So you wanna make sure that you use the blue flame, but then you don't wanna go so hot that things will start to spatter. Okay, so that's our experiment for today. Once you're done with this, all the waste from this experiment can be disposed of in the sink.